when you watch a film, you automatically identify with a cer- certain character. Therefore, the mm. the doctor, let's say the therapist, starts to actually get into your subconscious by you identifying with that character. So it's it's a way of unlocking and getting into like the deeper version of who you truly are by the fact that you identify with the characters in cinema and to actually start to see how you see the world and how you think and what you would do differently. Look at that. Bam! Another day in episode 423 of the Square to the Show. 24. Podcast. Sides of the <laughs> building. Uh, Halal Kush, uh, pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Halal is um, uh, an independent filmmaker, but also an acclaimed filmmaker who has won some awards. She's Lebanese and um, she teaches film. And do you want to tell us a little bit more about you and your background? Of course. So I'm a Lebanese film director and photographer. As you previously mentioned, I am um, internationally recognized, awarded as a photographer and filmmaker. Um, I first started doing fiction films and then I like deviated into docu- the documentary world. And now I'm turning back into fiction for another film. And like I film is a huge part of my life and it's what keeps me sane because I just keep creating like everything around me um, that actually causes pain or frustration is actually conveyed through my art that's because that's how we go to like why I'm into cinema therapy and every like I use cinema as a tool to heal myself and also like help the audience through my films also healed with me. Um, as for photography, it's something I, I like practice, but it's more of a hobby than something like I professionally do. Um, I'm also a film instructor, as you mentioned. I love teaching. I love sharing my knowledge. I love seeing people actually use um, any form of art for like self-expression and not just like for like a source of entertainment. And I'm also a voiceover artist sometimes. Nice. And I'm a writer. Like I'm 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 a poet, <laughs> but no one like some people know me for, for Hala and mm-hmm. others yeah. know me for like my other persona that's you know, mm-hmm. the writer. That's, that's a lot of roles that yeah. you're doing. <laughs> you're partaking in, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah. the, so you mentioned also cinema therapy. Could you explain like explain what's the concept behind that like what exactly does it do and who does it who is it targeted for well cinema therapy is almost for anyone um what's really special about cinema therapy is the fact that rather like you know how we as humans tend to um when like we put up these walls we don't like ourselves because exactly <laughs> and we put up these walls because we can't it's hard for us to actually go through whatever trauma happened in our past or in our present or any problem etc so when you have a hard time expressing yourself and you go to a stranger who's your therapist for the first time and he or she is a professional um they tend to use cinema therapy as a tool for you to open up because and how when you watch a film you automatically identify with a certain character therefore the Mm. the doctor let's say the therapist starts to actually get into your subconscious by you identifying with that character so it's it's a way of unlocking and getting into like the deeper version of who you truly are by the fact that you identify with the characters in cinema and to actually start to see how you see the world and how you think and what you would do differently. So that's one part inside of cinema therapy, but then the other side is actually the technical aspect of, for instance, me as a filmmaker actually using cinema Mm -hmm. as a tool to heal. But that's when you are someone who's with Salah Mahalak and like you have this emotional sensitivity and emotional intelligence to actually cope with your emotions and the people around you, of course. Wow. So does, uh, <laughs> is there also an aspect of cinema therapy where the person is, they themselves are like acting in the 
in the theater, let's say in theater or in a play, and maybe there's an essence of like therapy going on there in your as you're acting because you're expressing yourself in a, through a character. Of course, of course, of course. It goes over. There's like something called drama therapy, and that has to do with what you're saying right now. Okay. So, few, 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 like different forms of art therapy. I don't. I don't want to talk about something I don't know about. But like, I'm <laughs> sure it exists. I know drama therapy exists. So as uh, cinema therapy. Yeah, and so we've interviewed someone who's a drama therapist, and <laughs> yes. he comes and gets people punching and screaming and pretending they're hitting their parents and stuff like that. So. But what you're describing, cinema therapy, it sounds a little bit like brainwashing to me. You know, that's what you were describing. <laughs> it's like, and, and it's like, uh, it's funny because you're like, films get into your subconscious and like you relate to some characters. And then but yeah. it's like, we watch movies all the time, but I never, like, you don't, well, most people don't really think about it that way. You know, when you're watching a Marvel superhero, <laughs> that <laughs> but that's, you know, getting into your subconscious somehow. But um, I guess it is, right? I mean, um do you want to tell me about like what are like what are the films that maybe got into your head and you know made you think about this this way? I think our brains work in mysterious ways and they work in ways we cannot even fathom or ever understand and it's just beautiful and it's too complicated and too sensitive like your brain is constantly and actively just intaking not just films or stories or anything that's happening with you on the daily basis your brain is it is um i'll say it in french en train d'enregistrer it's uh, recording it's it's recording it's recording what is happening around you yeah. therefore when when we're like watching a film subconsciously yes you are feeding off of sometimes you sympathize with, with a specific character and and maybe that character is actually the villain whereas your friend sitting right next to you is like oh my god that's such an asshole and like to have bit that other character and you start to feel like maybe you don't want to actually speak up and say your own opinion because maybe i'm wrong for sympathizing with that specific character so it's it's very tricky, but I wouldn't see it as brainwashing. I just see it as a smart <laughs> and smooth way of um, accessing your subconscious. Because sometimes you need to trick your brain. And sometimes we can't do it, so we need professional help. As for films that I have personally watched and have, let's say, brainwashed me, I don't think there was like <laughs> any, but, but like mainly it's, let's say... Um, any of David Fincher's films or Christopher Nolan's? Well, that's like, so scary, uh, though. <laughs> They're all terrifying. In, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Inception, Interstellar, Fight Club. Um, the, these kind of films, Yelianja, yeah, you leave thinking, reconsidering your entire life. And I said, oh, oh my God, I need to do something different. <laughs> so you were watching Fight Club and then you saw Brad Pitt. You're like, oh, I relate to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's why it's a great film. Yeah, wow. I understand. And I want to say something that for me, films, if like that's the essence of filmmaking. If a film does not deeply touch you or just move you, like that's the purpose. That's the purpose at the highest level, of course. Like there are films that are, you know, garbage. Exactly, <laughs> just for, for entertainment. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, high art. Exactly. Um, I'm curious about your experience. So we talked about the first part, which is watching films, but you created films about emotional things that happened to you. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, the recent project you worked on, you worked on with your parents and stuff, and you were talking about, you know, uh, um, like your interpersonal relationships and stuff like that. What was that like to film it on camera? um what was it like with your parents did they <laughs> to make them agree to it because these things are like so see what I, I love that this film because it really is like um because everyone has you know problems with their family like I mean it's very like rare that there's a perfect family right and so um it's it's cool to see how you went and addressed it and everything that happens and the things you didn't think that were gonna happen that end up happening you know and it's like um it's uh, super cool, and congrats on the film. Uh, um, Thank so, you. So, uh, yeah, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, how, how that came? 
Yes, of course. Um, I believe, and مش قصة بس I believe, I know this for a fact. Whether people want to deny it or not, they can deny it. But we all know deep down inside our blood, okay, and our veins that this is true. We all have two parts of us. Like there's the inner child and there's the adult form of who we are with the egoistic whatever. My ego wanted to do like a fiction film and go very far away from actually facing my parents and just maybe get characters and write a story that would tell something lafishkhile. The other side of me that was like the inner child wanted, I didn't know she was deeply wounded. She wanted to directly go to her parents and actually face them and talk to them directly. So that's how like I came to conclude and decide and know, okay, Hala, you're the type of person who actually doesn't go around the bushes. You're actually, so if I were to actually, Manu, I had written like seven scripts that were fiction. I was like, hello, this is going to be your first documentary, but might as well do it because your gut feeling is telling you to do it. So I did. And it wasn't hard to get to convince my parents because look, like luckily my parents, oh, actually they trust me and they do love me. Um, and they were willing to do whatever it takes to, let's say, in a way, fix things out of it. So we, the convincing part was not an issue, but the entire process of this film was what was traumatizing. Like the first, <laughs> <laughs> the first part of actually like going through that phase of the incident that happened and then thinking for two years about making this film and then actually getting into action to make the film and then getting and you know, sit into your inside the film and you're like oh my god this is fucking happening you know what do i do right now and at the same time you're seeing the end you know although deep down inside you're hoping I'm I'm the type of person who's very optimistic, so I kept on hoping. No, no, no way, no way. A kid, we're gonna like, we're gonna have a hug. They're gonna apologize. Something good is gonna happen. No way. And after two years, your child is coming and talking to you all over again about something. They're making a fucking film just to communicate with you, and maha isir fiyshi tasaro. You know, it was just. Not logical for me. And I had high hopes and expectations. <laughs> and then, and then shit happened. And then everything mm-hmm. got fucked up. But right now, two years later, uh, my relationship has transformed. It has changed. But it wasn't an instant kind of press of a button. Mm-hmm. It was a way longer process. Right now, my relationship with them has transformed. It's way better. I feel like I'm heard because I cut the umbilical cord between them and I through this film. The film, and then they were like, eh, but, uh, no, what's the issue? Uh, no. Okay, and what if your dad hit you? That's not the end of the world. No, we got hit by our phone. But that was not the, the problem in the film anymore. The problem was the fact that I'm busy miscommunication and each generation thinks so this is what I think is fundamental and happens in each relationship or family uh, relationship or friendship or whatever we're not actually putting ourselves in the shoes of the other person in front of us to actually understand what they're actually saying or feeling mm-hmm. and it's a disaster so huh? Wow. So, yeah. And uh, you've been working on this film for a long time. So um, was it like, did you get like um, relief after finishing the film? Because it's so personal, plus all the mm-hmm. time and it's a movie that you're making and, you know, sending it out to festivals and stuff like that. Um, how do you feel about it now that it's over? Um. Do you, do you mean sense of relief, like me towards my parents or me towards the entire thing? Yeah, both. Towards my parents, I think the moment the, the last day of the shoot happened, I had my closure. I understood mm. that nothing is going to change. And <laughs> if something's going to change, it's going to be me. It's going to be how I am seeing things. Mm. And my closure was that I tried my best. And there's nothing more than I can do other than my best. 
Um, as for the entire general process, it was not an easy one. It was surely a rewarding one. If I would go back to the past and someone asks me is that I would do it all over again, my question, my answer would be definitely yes. But wow. this particular film is the type of film I never watch. Yeah, you know, I did it, <laughs> and I just watch it. I'm serious. I just watch it from festival to festival, if I have to. As a Muslim, I don't go screening, I don't go screening. No, each time I see it, you know, let's say, hello, it's been four years. The this is what's happening. Each time I watch it, it's as if it still happened. You know, I cannot deny this. It's still very painful. But it does not mean that I did not move on or I did not forgive Blackus. It's the total opposite. But it still does hurt. Mm -hmm. But it's cool that you're documenting all this and you made like a film out of it. I mean, it's kind of like a documentary about your life and you use a lot of like home footage in it and like things you filmed in the past. And so this is just, it feels like a continuation of that. Um, do you are you still filming all this kind of like home footage? Are you still planning on? <laughs> do you plan on you know making the, another the, one of these in the future? <laughs> the the funny part in all of this is the the home footage the home footage that you are talking about is not uh so it was my dad, and so that was like I found I came across them and it was like oof you know everything happens for a reason imagine my dad never ever thought i was going to be a filmmaker he was just filming in the house 25 years ago and then 25 years ago his daughter is now a filmmaker and she's using that footage to make a film which actually like started off her career and it was out of like a huge problem that had happened between between him and her so i just feel like everything happens for a reason And I feel like we only live once. Therefore, yes, I do document every single thing in my life. <laughs> I have like seven hard drives. I have seven hard drives and they're all like really well organized where like I have moments in my life. I have a folder for something, folder for other things. So yes, I do. I do document everything. And I do get criticized a lot for this because they're like, Hala, you're not living in the moment. You're not enjoying the moment. You're mm. like constantly just filming. But that's just me. It's it's part of who I am. It does not mean I'm not enjoying the moment. Black is I am enjoying the moment. And because I personally have a short memory, I want to watch these things all over again to actually see them and remember that they actually existed. Because to me, if I do I do not film, these things do not exist because nothing hangs in my memory. Literally nothing. So it's like these seven hard drives are actually my memory. Wow. And I don't want to like, I don't want to <laughs> use my, my actual brain that walks around every single day with all of like 25 or 27 years of memory. <laughs> I need to go through them, my memory, and then I go through the folders and check out what I want to dive back into. That's yeah. interesting that you're mentioning like that you're talking about memory, <laughs> yeah, specifically because um, I mean, what do you think about in the in the near future once our memory can just be up digitally uploaded? What do you think about that? That's that's a good question. I think it's already happening, don't you think? Like with social media, with um, mm -hmm. iCloud, <laughs> with all of these things, like it's already happening. We're already like living in this. <laughs> World. I, I think we're getting an appetizer like a taste of it uh now with yeah obviously with uploading your pictures and your videos and all that but i mean like your actual you know the memories from your brain from your subconscious mm. is like mm. uploaded digitally into some some hard disk or maybe some like some sort of cloud for just like human <laughs> human this, subconscious this Sarah, this would be fucking insane and i can't even imagine <laughs> i can't even imagine like i can imagine this happening in the world and era we're living in everything is literally possible but no honestly Really? Lanukerse at the same time. Yes, because some things could be very, very personal. Imagine these things are actually uploaded in a specific place where people yeah. can actually have access to other than you. I don't know. What the fuck? Okay. Mm. No, because I, I thought I thought you'd be actually a supporter for that since you know you you like to record all of your your memories and like to keep. I them like it. Yeah, but. 
exactly to keep them somewhere safe you said it but uh, no, what if she not ha- i die and someone opens my hard drives what's gonna happen then <laughs> oh. you know yeah you know so has to be inside my will i'd be like please uh put my hard drives with me inside the the tomb <laughs> or <see my> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Very good. This is like a sci-fi movie right now. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Oh, there's your Fantas. next idea. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, so like, what's your opinion on the on the, like the future of cinema, whether that includes you know AI and um, so uh, anything that, that has to do with technology? Pest technology is easing uh, up the technicalities of how films can actually be done mm-hmm. and i feel like the future of films are going to be based on other series other things that are actually shot through iphone edited through iphone ولا حتى بقى you need a pc to go and edit and do stuff professionally because you can like literally buy an app and just do everything on it mm-hmm. and i have personally had this experience like one of my other short films it's also a documentary I had not planned to film a, a documentary but I was randomly in the supermarket with my mom and then I just came in and got feeling I held my phone and I shot a one shot of my my mom inside the supermarket and then it was for a competition bil jazeera and I submitted it and you know labit bil editing hek it was shot on iPhone so absolutely no ma fi sound ma fi wada shi quality is fair it's not oh my god this no it's fair and it won third place in that competition so oh, wow. i think we we're, we're no longer in the era of who has the best camera and who is going to have like the best um technical uh, evolution it's more of how you're going to create the fastest way possible the most touching thing possible so it's all about just content it does no longer matter about what tool you're using and i think mm. that's beautiful but that's also very dangerous for the industry wow uh, why would you say it's uh, dangerous for the industry because has in no khalas yani a shwai betbattal tarouh al cinema there's no use <laughs> and that you can watch everything off of netflix off of your phone off of anything that's you know and nahna hala كثير صار في دروب اصلا ان لايك سينما كثير قليل الواحد بقى يقول او ماي جاد كثير عبيد يروح على السينما السينما صاروا اصلا بعيدا عن جاست كوفيد يعني انا في مره صارت معي دقه دي ولا لايك سوري ما احنا نفتح ان ليس في ات ليست 5 اور 6 بيبل هو ار انسايد ذا سينما سو سو اتس اتس ساد اتس ساد لايك ما بعرف بس ذا فيوتشر از كل واحد حيا يفتح سينما انسايد هيز اون هاوس يمكن ثرو هيز فون اند ذا نيو سكرين اور اي دونت نو I mean, maybe that's a, an idea also for like, you know, the cinema industry to change the, their product instead of create, building, you know, these massive cinemas and taking so much space inside malls and, you know, outside yeah. space. They can just mi- minimize it and like sell it to people in their homes. Yeah. Like, Honestly, they have to adapt. Hala, no. Like, I think we are a generation, especially in our generation, half of the generation that's even hala, the... the newcomers and yeah, the younger younger generation كثير we're like throw anything at us and we adapt so easily yeah you know it's كثير the, the trendy type of generation it's good and it's bad at the same time because the when trends come in you start to lose your identity and this is something that's and كثير happening you know most of people are losing their identities because they're just following trends and no one is actually focusing on who they are what their voice is what they look like what they want khalas kelayt na sheep just following this consumeristic uh, wave of and no yalla trends 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 so so on the, on that point what would your advice be for people who are trying to find their identity like they're trying to you know stay like they're trying to stay with the trends but at the same time understand who they are um I would say no one is going to come and tell you to believe in yourself. And I would say it's going to be the loneliest journey on earth. But it would highly 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 pay off 
because Anjad, no one's going to believe in you but yourself. And everyone's going to want to bring you down, especially sometimes it's people from family. Sometimes it's your closest friends. Sometimes it's anyone around you. No one wants to see you good. No one wants to see you cry. No one wants to see all the hardship you've gone through. People think, no, Hala, you're so lucky. Man, Anna, I had I had no social life and I still have no social life. It's a choice I took in order to get to where I am right now. And I'm happy about it. Do I feel sad sometimes? Do I feel lonely sometimes? Yes. But I'd rather be in my lonely world, let's say. I have inner peace and confidence because I believe in everything I am achieving. It's for a bigger purpose and a bigger goal. So I think you need to believe in yourself and you need to begin with the end in your mind. And you need to keep the end vision and the end goal in your mind so you personally keep pushing yourself every single day to achieve hey, the vision that you have in your mind. And no one, no one is going to come and tell you, hey, you have potential, do this. La, 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 la. Everyone black is they're going to be like, no, this is impossible, you can't do this. Habla and tema, oh, you think you're going to get to the Oscars? Oh my God, who the fuck do you think you are? Everyone's going to do that. Because everyone, trust me, is in a race. There's this constant hunger for fame and success. So... It's like a rat race. So it's about what you do with your time. Like, use your time wisely. You only live once. What have you done, Sata, with your life? Are you using it to the fullest to actually achieve whatever you are setting your mind to? You know, it's all on you. Don't blame your circumstances. So sort of. <laughs> getting pretty deep Kala. this is like um no you're you're so right about that you know everything you said i feel like one day this is gonna no. be part of your future documentary you're gonna come back and take clips from this like she just comes back all these, like, what have you done <laughs> What have you done? You guys, like, I need to, you guys, you guys are an example. Yani, yeah. marra, and okay, we slightly met, blah, blah, blah. I asked, and no, you guys explained, and no, you're doing this right before work. So you're actually, you have time, but you're even creating time when there's no time to do something you love. And it is paying off. Hatta law, maybe it's slow progress, but it's meaningful progress. It's not about how fast we're going to get there, Blackus. You guys are building something very solid one step at a time. And that is what is sustainable. Mish the fast progress of Yalla Leilu Duhaha. It does not happen that way. Everyone is so, you know, hey, I want to be famous. Hey, I want to be a millionaire. Bro, what are you doing about it? Please tell me what you do in your daily life. What's your discipline? But like, hey, no, I have a party. No, I have a party. No, I do something. Do something. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I think uh, COVID had a lot to do with like chain, like I think ruining everything a little bit. I feel like people were trapped in their homes, a little isolated. Um, they were sitting down all day, like all the bad habits came in and now we're post COVID, but it's still like people are still stuck a little bit in that COVID uh, mm-hmm. mindset. And um, yeah. Because you guys uh, mentioned something. Time. You mentioned like the power of actually adapting to change and okay, mm-hmm. now we're two years past COVID, but yalla, no. Okay, this is our new life. We're no longer going to go back to the other. This is the new reality. Like uh, romanticizing the past. This is our new re- reality. So I'm about to waste time. And what what yeah. are we doing now? How are we going to start with this new life? Yeah, Ali, I don't think it's fair to just blame COVID anymore because like, as we were saying... No, I'm just two years. Yeah. <laughs> two years years. <laughs> <laughs> not, not only yeah. that, uh, Hala, you also mentioned like this is we are the people of like adapt adaptation. We we adapt. Human beings in general they adapt. And mm. I mean, Ali, come on, the podcast started in COVID, so <laughs> there's there's also an example right there. Like you don't you don't let the bad habits just like sink in because the bad habits will always come around. Whether there's COVID or there's anything else, there's always an excuse that's just gonna stick there. Exactly. And you're gonna exactly. make it up for yourself. And something I wanted to tie to before you, so you mentioned two things. It's like fear of loneliness. And there was a point before that, which I can't really ver- uh, like say, say in one sentence, but I feel like those fears, that, that specific fear of uh, loneliness kind of affects your, 
your push to becoming to making something out of yourself you know to finding your identity mm. yeah mm. that was yeah you were talking about the identity and fear of loneliness these two i feel like are kind of like in one they work together in like harming a person mm. because when people are trying to seek out who they are like for example when you said you don't have a social life but you have inner peace because you you find that you found out who you are um you pushed away that fear of loneliness okay sometimes mm. you might feel it but you don't have the fear of it anymore while most people yeah, they have that true. fear because they still want to they go with the trends just so that they can feel like you know they're part of the community they belong to a certain exactly yeah. it's exactly. just a, it's a survival thing it's like it's true yeah this is what happens when you like that's how you separate you know those individuals who are capable of like fending off for themselves and then the people who are like just part of the pack there's mm-hmm. always like mm. every, people have different roles in society and especially in a community you have like people who can just you know do it by themselves they can lead the pack they can they don't need people to just like constantly giving them attention is like yes please support mm. me or whatever mm. then you have people that they fill in smaller roles and they you know they can't really do it by themselves but i mean teamwork sometimes is an essential is a crucial aspect of of survival it depends on who you surround yourself with i feel like and um especially i feel like now that i'm getting older i'm finding it easier to be alone by myself and do things my own way and have my own you know direction but like i'm wondering how when you were like a kid and you want to be a filmmaker I mean, I remember when I was a kid and I want to be a filmmaker, everyone would be like, oh, what do you think? Your name is Ali. You're going to go to L.A. and make movies? That's impossible. <laughs> uh, and then uh, um, and I heard that a lot. But then, you know, I don't know why I was crazy enough to just end up trying it. But um, I don't know what happened to you. How was like uh, when when were the first times that you wanted to be a filmmaker? Did you always want to be a filmmaker? And uh, how did people react to that? So that's how... Okay, I'm gonna. Did she all or? Side man. Side. That I want to clarify. I don't want to come off and give the impression. And no, I have everything figured out. And I, yeah, but خلاص, I know myself. Or blah blah blah. No, لا إنه صحيح. I've okay accomplished all of this and everything we've like discussed. And I am someone who's very confident, etc. etc. But no, ما حدا بيعرف حاله فلي. And I don't know, my next film right now, my feature film is about me. I'm just discovering the path I want because it might not be cinema. And I, I still do not feel like I belong anywhere. And I'm still searching. Like cinema does not fulfill my insides. It keeps me sane. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing that I find my voice in. But it no longer fulfills me from the inside. I'm trying to find another form of happiness. You can call me a little bit of a Wait, wait, wait. So you're saying that you're going to stop cinema? Like we never or... know. I know. I know. I know. My like. I said this when I first started uh, filmmaking and I came into the industry. Uh, okay. I was like, I'm gonna make only one feature film, and I would quit the major. Oh. Because I believe, and this is a statement that my second <laughs> persona, Divina Hell, says, and a cinema is a lifestyle that can cost one his life. And I truly believe it. So, Anna Benesbela, I just want to do one feature film, and then truth, and then should be said. But uh, no, I don't want cinema to be my entire life because it it could be very toxic. Now, going back to how I got into this major, <laughs> uh, honestly, I had I had a different uh, scenario than you, Ali. I wanted mm. to major in graphic design. And my dad um, had got me an iPad. Oh, I'm not an iPad. Okay, could buy them. Had a job with my my gift to a lot of. So I started taking a lot of pictures with my iPad, and then my dad, because he's an artist, he had this vision in me. And now lately, there's this new major. It's called audiovisual. And why don't you like search about it? I don't know. Yeah, okay. And I'm still passing. Can I know? I'm not even sure. Like, I don't know what is this. I used to only watch like horror films. And then, like, I started like researching and stuff, and then I applied, and then I got accepted, and then I I discovered, and okay, I was good at it, and then it just happened. 
<laughs> so no, I it, it's a just very different story than uh, Ali's. But you know, oh, wow. on my way to doing it, on my way to doing it, can feel a lot of bullying. Can feel a lot of you know, you'd never be good at whatever you're doing. Can feel still you know, I didn't start off as good. I had to prove myself um, through that uh, journey. Also, wow. I can, I'm imagining like it couldn't have been easy, like living in a <laughs> in an Arab country and being a woman wanting to do you know, like becoming a director and making films. How how tough was it? So, uh, how did you not uh, see any uh, obstacles? Uh, no, 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 no. I have a very different. Um, like, I know my feminism, but also that, but also that, but also that. It, ما فينا to deny you know, in certain countries مبلا, أكيد في a lot of obstacles for you being a, a woman filmmaker or hey, but no, صراحة, لا, I did not face it you know, I have maybe my masculine let's say side uh, is very present and it's very dominant and serious and my films حرام, يمكن my friends and people who work with me بخافوا ما بعرف بس إنه لأنه خلص بكون إنه I'm very determined I'm very serious I do not take no as an answer. Fishy Brosse, I will achieve it no matter what. If you tell me no, I'm going to go find a gazillion way and do it and show you and take pictures. And no, bro, I did it. But uh, no, la, I never faced any issues, honestly. It was very supportive. Very supportive. I didn't know I'm a woman. Blackest, it was even more supportive. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's uh, beautiful because. Um... You know, Lebanon, well, that's the beautiful thing about Lebanon. We really care about the arts and the crafts and the music and mm. the entertainment. And and the biggest filmmaker in Lebanon is uh, Nadine Lebeke right now, who's, you know, exactly. uh, known for an Oscar exactly. and her film is the best Lebanese film, I'd say, right now. And so it's like, exactly. it is like you have someone up there you're looking at and a great role And model. it's a woman. Yeah, and she's a woman, too. Yeah. Exactly. As much as exactly. I love Ziad Dwayri, too, he's also been part of Amazing. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I hate generalizing, you know, I hate generalizing mm-hmm. in everything, and especially when it comes to cinema. Like, hatta when someone asks me, Hello, what's your favorite film? And I can't, I can't tell you what's my favorite film because maybe I haven't watched my favorite film yet. I might tell you now what right now resonates with me, but even tomorrow I'm going to watch a film and it's going to be my favorite film, you know? Each film has its own backstory, its own content, its own kilshi. You can't just say, it's my favorite, you know? Yeah. So, okay, then so, let's, yeah. the, we can rephrase the question if you'd like. We, well, <laughs> I know we didn't ask it, but like we can rephrase it for you. Uh, which movie has made you like express your, like your emotional side the most or let out the most emotions while you're watching it? Okay, what was the question? The question, the question is which movie has allowed you to like express the most emotions while you were watching it um very good question for someone who has a very bad memory <laughs> <laughs> it goes through the hard drive now it's like watching on... <laughs> can, can we skip the the no <laughs> There are a lot of films yeah. where I actually got emotional, but you know, maybe I can say Interstellar because of the relationship between the, the daughter and the father. Yeah. Oh. I think um, it's... And the way Christopher Nolan like uh, put it, and keep, you know, a father keeps his promise, and how you know, the Zalame came back even after all these years. Yeah. And it, it was Heiko, you know, he was behind the... Um, the bibliotheque and he was screaming and she couldn't hear him and like it's dimensional so it it went into the insides of who I am what I'm talking about yeah <laughs> hello hello when you 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 referenced Interstellar didn't you in that um the fishing film you need the uh, um right and fishing out the sea music and there's the door yeah, exactly. And there's the doorway right there on the beach and stuff like that. Isn't that interstellar music you had right there? <laughs> no, it was it was Max no? uh, it was Max Richter. I don't know if you know him. He he's oh. the music composer of yes. uh, Arrival. Oh, it was Arrival. I see. And then um 
that's yes. pretty cool. And you, you use that, <laughs> were you able to send it to film festivals or do you just do it for uh, yourself? And Yeah. You mean that's... you mean the, the music? Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, Anna, personally, I did talk to him. I can, like, I contacted their, uh, their company because I keep them off your copyright, so heck, or you're not allowed to. And I had what? told them, and, <laughs> hey, and I told them I, I'm a student, who, you know, and they would it cost for me to actually get the copyrights. So, you what I can cheat Sammy Dollar or Mobile Fix She. So, I was like, I'm sorry, you know, I can't afford that. $900. But Zakar, uh, no. Eh, and Oh. So, eh, no, it was Anja, you know, she three three minutes, you know, the entire composition, you can, it's nine or something like that. So I remember, you know, honey, they say when you tweak the music or you add many other layers to it, then maybe you can, in a way, use it. So then I did. Well, Fishing Out of the Sea didn't go internationally, uh, maybe into mm. only one festival. It was more of like local festivals. So, you know, I didn't face any issue. Who are those? I mean, Max, if there is a Russian. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a cool story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I'm also um curious what I want to tell you um, um, yeah, about what you were saying about like uh, cinema like destroys you and stuff like that. I kind of a little bit agree, but I also think that um, I think that the most successful filmmakers are people who ha- who do different things and have different perspectives. You know, like you're not just like a um like just a filmmaker you, you know studying film writing about film teaching film no like people who have original unique stories you know and and they live interesting lives and then every once in a while they use that into their movies and uh, i think that's the, my biggest advice to every, anyone who is in the film industry you know is just to have an interesting life and then also make movies because making money doing movies is impossible i think even for I'll the big add. elite you know so it's like i can't imagine I'll for add. everyone else Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree that? any further because this is my struggle. And I know I feel like, let's say eight years, my entire life revolved around cinema to the point where I no longer knew how to live life. I, I don't know what to do. Okay. I, I can't even enjoy a camping. I can't enjoy a walk in nature. You know? So this disconnection and actually living a healthy, like, outside life outside you know external life outside cinema is a huge must and what you also said of them leading different other things and then once every once in a while I'm at Hesfi this need of I need to talk about this specific topic because I have a specific vision on this specific topic then okay I'd make a film that's mission constantly making them so that's why you know I'm working I'm trying to find other things I might be good at the my only source of artistic uh, outcome or freedom is the mm-hmm. reason why I know I, I needed let's say financial stability so I'm yeah, teaching totally. yeah yeah and um, how do you like teaching are you learning things from teaching <laughs> are you learning from teaching that is helping you out in films um, teaching is a very unique experience because you will also keep learning in the process. But sit in the tariff, where are your gaps as a mm-hmm. filmmaker? So then you start to keep like refreshing your mind, your mom, but sub in a way. Your brain is constantly actively working because you are like, spreading this um, content with someone else. And at the same time, you learn a lot from your students. Sometimes their perspective on things starts to challenge you. Sometimes like you really get challenged by these new generation their way of doing things is very fast and very smart at the same time it's very uh, different to how we are programmed to doing things take your time, be a perfectionist Mm -hmm. plan everything so till now, alhamdulillah it's very rewarding Um, that's amazing I think that people are too, like, as you said earlier, like, they want things too fast, you know, and, um, like, maybe you can do that on TikTok, but <laughs> for a movie, it takes exactly. time, and it takes, a, you know, and especially if you want it to be impactful and something that lasts mm. a long time, you know, exactly. so um, I feel like that's missing from, and a lot of things in our society, people are too, in my opinion, afraid to slow down, slowing down. 
taking the time. This is this is yeah. so true, and this is like also part of my new film, like the feature film. You can see the layers in this new feature film because I discovered you know we're all in a rush and we're not even aware that we're in a rush. And when you start to slow down, you start to anxiety. You know, oh my god, I'm unproductive. Oh my god, what I'm not doing anything. Oh my god, I'm unworthy. Oh my god, what am I doing with my life? And then, slow. In fact, you need to slow down just to see where you you are in Aslan. You need to have this um, point of view, omniscient, like no man border. This external kind of vision mm-hmm. on what's happening and where you Aslan are put in society. But to, that to judge yourself and see how you can better. Uh, your mindset and to unlearn everything society, friends and family, religion, politics has set over you to mm-hmm. uh, protect your individuality. <laughs> yeah, self awareness is huge, and um, definitely, um, the life unexamined is not a life worth living. So you always gotta be looking at exactly. your life and be like, "Is this the life I want?" <laughs> and I think, then working. I, love, I think the issue with people is uh, the, the reason why they're constantly in a rush is because. They want to distract. They want to keep their mind distracted from the actual issues that are affecting them, which only come mm-hmm. to their thoughts when they're slowing down. Because if you're constantly mm-hmm. in a rush to do things, first of all, you're not thinking of the the issues that you have. You're not self-reflecting, and you're not uh, managing what your thoughts are of yourself, of your the people around you, of the It's situations you're being you're going through, and your own emotions. Plus, you're always looking for instant gratification because you're constantly just looking for quick and easy happiness. You know, just like small, mm-hmm. just like mm-hmm. let's let's take that let's bits take that. and this, pieces. You know, yeah, it's like a a quick ser- serotonin rush or sorry, dop- is it dop- dopamine? I can always mistake the two. Uh, dopamine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, like a quick dopamine rush. Yeah, they just want to want it quickly, and it even affects people when they're choosing their career paths. I was talking to a guy yesterday, and he was like, um, he rejected a job just because he said that the results that he would, the impact that he would have on that job, because it's in politics, is like I would not be able to see the the results of it instantly or in a tangible way. So Oof. he, yeah, I, when Oof. he, I was listening to him explaining that, I was like, but you can still have an impact. That's not the point. You can still do something, and. Oof. Yeah, so it's just it's interesting how you keep how you think of when you watch people and like observe their behavior. It's mainly revolved around just avoiding their current issues and just constantly running around trying to avoid being anxious. Running like away from their eh, 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 it's we're just running away from ourselves. No one in a bad lahalla sarah. I haven't had someone. بلا إنه لما أكون كمان عم زيدا في بس إنه it's a very very extremely rare uh, percentage in the world of people actually putting the effort investing in themselves to actually work on themselves and be with themselves on their own. Mm-hmm. لأنه صراحة إذا each and every one of us did actually do that as like just um, an act of responsibility towards yourself as a human being, we would all be living in peace. ما بيكون في war ما بيكون في ولا شيء لأنه yeah. at least بيكون في شيء اسمه we all know how to communicate with one another بلا anger بلا miscommunication بلا misunderstanding you know people think you know هلا يمكن نحن عم نتفلسف بس وحيت الله it all falls down to being self aware mm-hmm. and emotionally intelligent and um, philosophy is important too it's good to have a right perception of the world <laughs> and um, not <laughs> not just like fall into traps and let people brainwash you you know you have to look at things and then process it in your own way as opposed to letting everything you know brainwash True. You pretty much um True. we're kind of wrapping up on time speaking of time but do you want to tell us about Yay. your new film hello yeah um my new film is going to be a feature fiction film mm-hmm. and um that's all i can say okay. <laughs> i can not <laughs> <laughs> I cannot I cannot give details because Saraha it started off as a documentary it was entitled mm. the place where I belong and it got accepted into Itfa Itfa is like the largest most important film festival in the world for documentaries we were here for a workshop I had already started with it and everything but then again as the film is developing I then came to realize you know, that this film needs to be a fiction 
the reason aslan why i'm here in lebanon is because i devoted myself to film this film in lebanon so right now i'm here because i'm trying to discover my path to make this film i'm trying to get funding so uh, um trying to gather my team and i'm also like still in the development phase i'm writing the script to could see so perché faccio sene se non ho no the the movie is like yeah perfect and crucial mm-hmm. well we can't wait to see it that's for sure podcast yeah <laughs> yes. exactly <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much, Hala. Yes. Really, uh, guys, uh, thank, thank you, Elkom. Hala, thank you thank so much you for so coming much. onto the show. We really enjoyed your time. And guys, for whoever <laughs> is watching, please don't forget like, subscribe, <laughs> and follow us. Mostly subscribe. Yeah, yes. not <laughs> And we will be watching this episode with Hala Kush very soon. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Woo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a podcast. <laughs> Bye. Recording side. Goodbye, Hala. It was nice to meet you.